Hi, I'm Caroline, a yoga teacher with a special interest in menopause based in Edinburgh. And hi, I'm Dr. Claire, a GP with a special interest in menopause based in North London. Together, we are the Menopause Sisters and we're here to guide and support you through your menopause journey. Hello and welcome to the Menopause Sisters show with Caroline, myself and Dr. Claire, my sister. We are welcoming Laura Brydon today and I'm very excited because I'm a huge, huge fan of her book, The Hormone Repair Manual. Um, Laura is a, a naturopathic doctor and author of the best-selling books, Period Repair manual and hormone repair manual. She has more than 20 years experience in women's health and currently has consulting rooms in Christchurch, New Zealand, where she treats women with PCOS, PMS, endometriosis, perimenopause and many other hormone and period related health problems. Welcome, Lara. Thank you so much for joining us. The time difference worked perfectly, doesn't it? <laughs> it's almost 12 hours, 13 hours, I guess. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So as I said, I'm a massive fan of your book I mean you can just see it. I've got lines and notes and pages <laughs> Post- folded over yeah it's one Post-it of those notes yeah, yeah. yeah literally you know kind of graffitied book but um it was wonderful to kind of remind myself and refresh myself of what you what you mentioned in the book over the last couple of days in preparation speaking to you today and a few lines you sort of come in quite early on in the book and you know you mentioned that many symptoms are temporary perimenopause is a sequence of events and that perimenopause and the first couple of years of postmenopause a critical window for health for women Mm -hmm. and for me that just summed up everything Claire and I you know trying to educate empower and really communicate to women who listen to our show well the critical window is important it's one of these messages that I think women need to hear it's a little hard to hear sometimes because you don't necessarily want to think now is the time I have to look after my health but now is the time it's a recalibration of a number of systems, including the nervous system, also metabolism. And if we can recalibrate healthily and come out the other end, we're set up really well for the next three decades of our life. It's an, you know, an investment in those next few decades. Unfortunately, if things go a little bit off the rails, and of course, that's not always because of something we've done wrong, that could just be stress or other factors, then what the research shows is we're you know, potentially then kind of on track for some of the negative outcomes, like just to mention, you know, dementia, cardiovascular disease. So the stakes are high. And I guess that's, you know, how I see it personally. It's how I see it with my patients. It's let's just take this as a critical window or a window of opportunity to be as healthy as we can. And I think it's, a, it's really hard for women at this point, you know, for the women that do reach this stage in their kind of 40s, early 50s, I think it's really tough because you possibly have got to a point in your life where, you know, you know what you like to eat. <laughs> or yeah. you, you maybe enjoy a glass of wine or there's just things you know about yourself and perhaps you enjoy and suddenly that that change or just thinking a little bit more holistically about the next phase or next 30 years of your life can be quite a challenge. It is. Well, as part of the reinvention process of perimenopause, it is a time to turn the page onto the next chapter. And I think many of us going through it, or I've you know pretty much gone through it, it you can feel that in your body somehow. It's like, this is a time of change. I'm just going to let go of some old things, maybe embrace some new things. And some of that could be, I'll just mention alcohol right off the top. <laughs> alcohol is not our friend during this recap calibration process for lots of reasons. And it, I would argue, is a very good time to reevaluate the relationship with alcohol. I think, I think, I don't know, I think in my book, I even use the phrase, it's like, it's not your friend. It feels like your friend sometimes, but it's, it's not, it's a toxic friendship. You get set in your ways, don't you, when you reach this transition and changing can be really difficult because you have become accustomed to certain habits and certain ways of life and and that recalibration is almost sort of letting go of what you knew worked for you before and changing and and thinking up and learning things that need to happen for you to feel better we often speak about kind of letting go and that grief process during the perimenopause and menopause and how it it is for, for many women not always and a positive experience it can be a, a really difficult time. And I just wondered if you had some thoughts about that in terms of that whole emotional side of it. <laughs> so difficult to, to, to sort of grasp, but also let go and move on from. Yeah, it's a heady mix of things. Yeah. So you, in my book, chapter two is the emotional chapter where I talk about stigma, shame, freedom, return to girlhood, 
and yeah. grief. I think those are some of the emotions. Um, and a lot of it's, as you, you know, for any listeners who are already sort of going through this, a lot of it's just a little different than what you expected. And there's some, always something a little different around the corner. I, my publisher had to talk me into writing that chapter because I headed into it thinking, no, no, I'm just going to give the physiological sort of nutritional, you know, hormonal aspects of the process. And they said, no, you can't write about this without talking about some of those emotional challenges. And the very end of that chapter, I just had voices, like some quotes from my followers about their experience. And they're all so different, which is also in that chapter about have, giving permission to experience it differently than the next person. And then you might've heard someone on, on social media or an article, you know, sort of saying what their experience was, you might be different. And that's actually allowed. <laughs> that's, that's fine. You have to each have to sort of navigate our own way emotionally and it's trying not to be self-critical i know we we briefly talked you know you practice yoga and obviously i'm a yoga teacher and it's that element of that sense of peace with yourself in some way and not bringing judgment and as you say you know we are all individuals and particularly Mm -hmm. um here in the uk the nice guidelines suggest with you know with medicine that actually your gp would would treat you as an individual woman because each woman Mm -hmm. will experience this phase of their life as an individual and very, very differently to somebody else, to your friend, your mom, your neighbor, you know, it can be a very different process for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that stigma is, I think what um, here in the UK is still very, very apparent. It's still menopause and perimenopause is still a bit of a taboo. And certainly in certain cultures that I, you know, in women that I speak to, there isn't a word for perimenopause. There isn't a word sometimes for, and I, I use this word in inverted commas, this phrase, because I hate it, but vaginal atrophy. Mm-hmm. Um, there isn't that word. And it's very difficult to speak about it. Um, and it's it's about changing that stigma, isn't it? It's about being kind of, this is a normal this is a normal process. It's not a disease. It just needs to be embraced. And actually, it can be really positive. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. It's, it's hard to not be ashamed because of well, it's an intersection between to some degree, I think, you know, misogyny and anti-age. So it's women aging is just a, yeah, yeah. society doesn't want to hear about it. <laughs> but yeah. yet that once you get here, I don't know, I just say like once you actually get here, you think, oh, it's fine. It's like I think even as young women or as a young woman, I personally had some sort of dread of menopause and and then once you get here it's almost like this sort of inside knowledge is like actually this is fine I don't know I don't know if people listening share this or but I can reassure younger women when you get here it's actually fine <laughs> I think I, yeah and I, I'm gonna resonate with that because actually I had a, a brilliant chat with a, a couple of women it was a few months ago now and we were talking about that kind of sense of freedom it can actually give you so although yeah. you're navigating perhaps some challenging symptoms there's also that sense of a kind of freedom I you know yeah. it's, this is this is going to be okay I'm going to get through yeah. this you know if you can navigate it with the help of you know diet exercise whatever yeah. you are doing to help yourself you'll come out the other side and I love mm-hmm. you mentioned the book the Japanese word for menopause is is kone- koneki I think it is yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, can you maybe just say suggest or just explain what you know why you included that well it's it's renewal right so it's it's welcoming the next phase of our life, which is not a short phase. It's potentially 30 years or more, 30 or 40 years, at least a third of our life. So yeah, it's it's exciting. I love that idea of rather than dreading this, this change that's happening to you is embracing it and making it a positive change. And as you said, you know, second half, second spring, just having that sort of it, it's it is the second half where we can reevaluate things and someone said to me recently um it's where you know I've always had a fear of missing missing out I've always had FOMO <laughs> I've got to the point yeah. where I can say no and actually that's fine because I just don't want to do that right and the truth is we're going to miss out on most things in life right <laughs> like big picture like we only get a certain number of things that yeah. we can do in our lifespan so we've already missed out so we might as well just relax about it. One thing I just want to bring something into this. I hope your listeners are interested. You know, I'm a, before I became a naturopathic doctor, I'm an evolutionary biologist. So when I was researching this book and going into menopause myself, I started looking at the evolution of menopause. And I, for me, philosophically, it's been, and just emotionally, it's been quite important because there's this narrative that menopause is an accident of living too long. And that is not what the research shows actually that 
we, that even ancient people, a few of them got through to old age, got through to 70 or 80. A lot of them died in childbirth and in childhood and much younger. So the, the average age or the life expectancy was quite low, obviously, as you know, but their lifespan, there were always individuals who got through. And I talk about this in a little bit more detail in my book. And I refer to a book called The Slow Moon Climbs, which I always mention by Susan Matcha. And I loved it. And she built the case. All She wove together all the threads of evidence that potentially menopause or essentially women who are post-reproductive, women after 45, were the driver basically were the reason for the evolution of a longer human lifespan because women in that age group, you know, 45, 55, 65 are very productive for their people, for their group. You know, they, they get a lot done. They gather food. They it's got, there's a couple of quotes from anthropologists, like how would tribes survive without their, you know, I don't know what they call it, like their core of old ladies, like, you know, gathering food, making sure everyone's okay. And I just love that. And, and I thought that, And it rings true, right? Like, you know, everyone knows some 50, 60, 70 year old women who are just getting stuff done. And you think they're, they're doing it. Like, how would we get by without them? So it really kind of reframes this idea that we're just superfluous, like sort of, you know, accidentally still alive. That is not the case it's quite a modern concept really isn't it you know these wise women who would look after extended family and community members yeah it's probably i imagine you know the latter half of the last 30 or 40 years perhaps with social media as well coming on board that there's that thought process that aging isn't great you know or you know that anti-aging revolution we were talking to danny bingston a couple of weeks ago and she was just talking about the pro-aging movement that's beginning to evolve Mm, nice you know and which is lovely you know embracing your lines embracing your gray hair embracing this transition well we got to live this long and i mean so i did the quick calculation when i turned 50 my husband did a quick like sort of search it's like for someone born in 69 like i was there in canada you know there was uh, only a 9 in 10 chance that i would make it to 50 so already like you know done well i just be <laughs> grateful that i t- got to 50 and hopefully i'll get to the next decade and the next one but yeah it's silly to be sad about it <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> celebrate getting to this this point. Yeah. We'll take a pause there and just listen to some messages from our sponsors. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. good, good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Welcome back to the Menopause Sisters show. We are here with Laura Bryden and we were just talking about embracing this this part or this time of our lives and actually seeing it a seeing it as a positive and the renewal years, that energy that we can really begin to take forwards and become quite productive, actually, in, in other ways. Um, something that you do um, mention in your book, Laura, that I wanted to touch on was kind of histamine and, and low histamine diets, mm. because there's a lot of chat around that at the moment, whether that's on social media and amongst women's groups that support perimenopause and menopause. Um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it and explain you know, what, what's meant by these terms. Yeah. So histamine is obviously part of the immune system. It's involved in allergies. That's the thing we know it best for, but it's also a neurotransmitter. It's quite stimulating to the brain, but it causes anxiety, irritability in excess, insomnia, which kind of sounds familiar with perimenopause. And there's a tight relationship between the hormonal system and the immune system, particularly around histamine, just as there's a tight relationship between lots of parts of the body. But in particular, high estrogen, which is actually what happens in our the earlier phases of perimenopause, eventually, obviously, estrogen goes low. But in the first phases, there's this like almost explosive estrogen <laughs> spikes going very high and then dropping very low. And the, all that estrogen potentially stimulates histamine. So lots of things can stimulate a histamine release, but estrogen is one of them. And then there's a feed forward mechanism in that high histamine can also stimulate more estrogen. So there's definitely, there's something going on. I, I, in my work, you know, I've been working with this for a while with patients and looking at the literature. And I would perceive that a lot of what sort of generally gets called estrogen dominance. I don't know if that's a term. It's not a, not a term I use actually, but that's a very popular 
term discussing health or certainly in the natural health space, I think a lot of what's being described there is actually kind of a histamine, like headaches and fluid retention. And so this is a way in to relieve symptoms, right? Rather than it's sort of, it's another angle on how can we access that set of symptoms. So we can, I mean, we could focus on trying to stabilize, you know, lower estrogen or counterbalance it with progesterone, this, that, that hormonal side of things, but also we could come in from an immune side of things and just try to calm down the whole mast cell. Mast cells are what the part of the immune system that makes histamine and histamine release. And that can give a lot of relief, just straight out relief for perimenopausal headaches and irritability and insomnia and fluid retention. Some women get hives. So that really speaks directly to the role of histamine. And that can take the form of, you know, trying some antihistamines over the counter or just to see what kind of relief that gives. That can be somewhat diagnostic. I think if an antihistamine relieves symptoms, then that tells you, confirms that this part of what is going on is due to the immune system. And then from a natural perspective in the book, I outlined some ways to calm histamine and mast cells long-term and from a natural perspective. And I can just give you the top three things for that maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, one would be no alcohol. This is actually just only one of several reasons yeah. why alcohol is bad. Like I, you could have me back on a podcast to talk about all the reasons that alcohol is not good in our forties, but histamine is part of it just addressing any gut issues can really help because the gut is involved in mast cell and activation and also um, clearing histamine from the body. And then the other one I just want to mention is cow's dairy. Now, just to preface it, not most people are, I'd say most people like a, a, you know, modest sort of majority are fine with dairy. This is where it gets confusing, right? So there's about, but there's about a third of people, maybe third to a half, depending on the demographic who get an inflammatory, potentially histamine reaction from cow's dairy. And so it's like, you know, the people who aren't sensitive to dairy are kind of going, what are you talking about? Dairy's fine. And the people who are sensitive to dairy is like, wow, like coming off dairy changed my life, you know, eliminated my premenstrual symptoms and, you know, all these things. So I would just draw people's attention to that. It may or may not apply to you. I can usually see it clinically, there's like, you know, there'd be these people who had a history of when they were kids, recurrent ear infections, recurrent tonsillitis, this kind of immune thing going on. And then later in life, you know, premenstrual symptoms, potentially like uh, chronic nasal congestion, especially from dairy. And the other thing I'll just bring into this is mast cells and histamine and potentially dairy are also involved in heavy periods. So the uterine lining is full of mast cells, which I only learned like five or six years ago. I thought that makes so much sense. And they release not only histamine, but they release heparin, which is a blood thinner. So this is, this plays a role in heavy periods. Again, it's not the sole cause of heavy periods, of course, but as some of your listeners may know, very, very heavy periods are a feature of perimenopause of being 40 something for some women. And so this whole antihistamine approach, potentially getting off normal cow's dairy can lighten flow as well as relieve some of the premenstrual symptoms. And it's not subtle. Like when this is the right thing to do, this antihistamine, potentially no dairy approach, it's, you can feel it within a few cycles. Like it's, it's um, quite a strong effect, potentially therapeutic intervention. As you were speaking earlier, weren't we about how this could, you know, progesterone intolerance and, and how, giving giving women antihistamines in this transition can be so helpful yes and actually when we're thinking about your health generally we're thinking about an antihistamine is a really simple remedy that could have a huge impact on your symptoms and it's particularly beneficial I think for women who potentially can't take hormonal therapy or can't take certain types of hormonal therapy or other alternatives and we think about the menopause and we can't, we automatically think about HRT, don't we? Well, at least I do as a Western doctor. <laughs> but we think about alternatives, but we also think about those women that for, for whatever reason can't take HRT. And for some women, this can be a, this can be a game changer, actually. It's not going to alleviate all your symptoms. It's not going to, you know, make the inroads into long-term health protection potentially that the HRT can, but antihistamines can give you back that sense of well-being, particularly with your sleep, particularly with that overactivation of your immune system that can that can so can be so devastating in the, in this perimenopausal transition. 
my work is often about just finding some simple solutions. It doesn't have to be complicated. And I agree. At this stage in our lives as well, you know, if you are suffering with the symptoms, you want to keep it simple. I was just going to say, you know, too much, too big a changes and too quickly just throws everything into kind of disarray. And so it's just trying small, simple things step by step and tweaking things as you go to find those changes that help you and support your symptoms. I agree. There was another great quote that I read in your book, Laura, that was fantastic. I actually listened to it on Audible. The quote was the Marie Curie quote, which sort of kind of harks back to what we were saying earlier about nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. And now is the time to understand more so that we may, may fear less. And I just want to put that up in capital letters <laughs> and draw people's attention to that within your book because for me that really epitomizes perimenopause and menopause it's something not to be frightened of not to be scared about is to embrace it with open arms and to make the positive changes that are within your reach for some women that means going to your healthcare provider and here in the UK we know that, that can be really hard to mm-hmm. do partly because of the taboo, but partly because there's still a lot of work that needs to be done around training our GPs in the UK about this. Do you have any tips about how, I mean, we, we've, we've spoken about this before, but I wondered, we like to get kind of tips from people about how they might approach their healthcare provider. What would be helpful to say? What would be helpful to do for these women that are finding it a struggle to perhaps get the advice that they need? Yeah. Well, as you know, in the book, I've got peppered throughout the how to speak with your doctor sections on different topics. I, th- I think, and those are actual just like little quotes, like phrases and, you know, sentences and questions you can ask. And I guess if we're talking, you know, in part here about accessing hormone therapy, you know, there's sort of a few quotes around that. I would just say, because you're right, a lot of doctors are still quite frightened of it. And yet, as you know, modern hormone therapy is very different and some of the sort of fears around it 20 years ago are not something we need to worry about anymore. So, you know, there's just things like, you know, saying to the doctor, am I, you know, am I a candidate for this? Or, you know, why are you saying that that's not safe? And I guess potentially being able, I don't know what the system's like that, but like just get a second opinion, I guess, if you, if you just get a hit a wall with the doctor, actually, one thing I see to my, one thing I do say in the book, I've certainly said to people on social media is when you call to make your appointment with the doctor. I don't know how it works there, but you could say to the receptionist, which doctor in the practice works with menopausal women or is experienced in prescribing hormone therapy, because then you get the right person. And it's usually as you can, I would think there's usually at least one or two in the practice who feel really good about it. And um, so that's a way to kind of take a shortcut to someone who is comfortable and up to date. That's a great tip actually, because yeah. Like you say, it's not always about HRT, is it? It's about alternatives and it's having the confidence. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't want HRT. Can right. I really have cognitive behavioral therapy and how do I approach that? Or yeah. what are the alternatives to HRT? Is there someone that I could speak to about what might help me if I don't want to go down the hormonal route? And all these options mm-hmm. are open to women and it's about having the confidence to, to ask for that advice, but also being able to, in a way, I think, push that advice a little bit as well and feel confident in that I know Caroline you've 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 had something similar haven't you really yeah and that's exactly actually Laura what I did you know I I kind of looked just on the website you know and 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 looked at the doctors that you know had that special interest as it were and and, you know and pick them and actually you can do that quite easily and we often talk about the nurses sometimes in a practice can be almost you know better informed and that could be a first point of call go they can recommend websites or perhaps speak to you to begin with you know there's early stages you begin to navigate this and and make those choices and decisions around what might help you in your symptoms because i think you just i think as women there's a lot of misinformation out there so it's about getting the right information the well you know researched mm-hmm. evidence-based information and going well how do i want to navigate this next part of my life For sure. And also don't underestimate the nutritional movement, quitting alcohol, like some of the things like some of the core changes I recommend in the book, because they're not small, right? Like the the impact from those can be quite huge. So I just, I'm always sort of, I think we have this idea, okay, the alternative things are just like a fluffy add on, but they can actually be core life changing things. And they're simple. And they're obviously, you know, quitting alcohol and taking magnesium is available to anyone and getting outside in the morning and moving your body and these you know they're they're um 
the impact, the, uh, the payoff could be huge. And that's yeah. exactly how I manage my symptoms. For, you know, I, I yeah. kind of was, became perimenopause in my uh, sort of early 40s, around 40. And that's exactly how I was managing my symptoms through nutrition, yeah. through diet, through movement, through yoga. Um, yeah. And it was only when it got a little bit more, you know, the kind of the fatigue and the, for me, the muscle ache and bone, bone ache got a little bit more. Mm. I thought, well, I maybe want to have a, I have a conversation with my GP about this and just maybe take the edge off. But I think absolutely sure. we just should encourage all women to, to look at those avenues of exercise and nutrition my goodness i think i know we've talked about alcohol now mentioned it a few times but that's an absolute game changer i think you know for me if it i is. have a glass just half a glass of wine now i know the next morning i'm going to feel like i have drunk three bottles of wine <laughs> and my whole body is going to hurt so i you know i know and it's yeah. again it's just listening to your body and going well what have i eaten drunk what have i done that has meant this symptom has got a little bit worse or increased. I'm going to say two more things about alcohol and then I <laughs> promise I won't keep going on. So one is obviously, yes, there can be immediate effects. Like for me personally, and when I was in the thick of, you know, the worst of the perimenopausal symptoms, which weren't that bad for me, but were present, I would be like, oh, this beer with dinner would be lovely. But do I want to wake up all sweaty at three in the morning? It's like, hmm, actually I don't. So I'm not going to have that but so there's that immediate if effect but there's also a cumulative like i discovered a few years ago that the research around if you just avoiding alcohol generally um strengthens the sleep cycle like strengthens and the circadian rhythm and makes it healthier so you start to get deeper sleeps daily night by night by night not just the nights that you haven't had alcohol so that's something very i would just, just ask people to experiment with that and see what happens to your sleep after a few weeks of alcohol. And just one more thing about alcohol that it's just a little fact that actually, Claire, you can help me with the exact numbers on this, but my understanding is that um, moderate drinking. So, you know, four or five drinks in the week increases the risk of breast cancer more than modern estrogen therapy. So I think when people kind of know that, because of course it's still, as we you know, there's still a lot of fear around hormone therapy, but the, yeah, like somehow we don't hear about the breast cancer risk associated with even moderate alcohol intake. And I, I don't know why I, I do kind of suspect the alcohol industry has had a role in like just keeping that part, keeping the lid on that, <laughs> keeping that quiet. Yeah. yeah. It's lots of, lots of women that come in and, and they're obviously seeking general advice about the menopause. So it's not specifically related to the to HRT, but I often say, you know, here in the UK, it's probably one in six to one in seven. If you're uh, at risk of breast cancer if you're born after 1960 in the UK so that's quite a big number but actually your risk of breast cancer is so much greater if you drink a couple of units of alcohol a day than mm -hmm. if you were to take HRT or the newer types of HRT that's and okay. when I think women hear that and understand that your diet your lifestyle your alcohol consumption is far more likely to reduce your risks of breast cancer than taking HRT will increase it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Then that that's quite an eye opener, I think, for many for many women. Because you know, don't forget, we've been fed. Probably you, you might be similar. Women in the country, and certainly as a GP, I I was fed very stark statistics following the the WHI study, and took all my women off HRT immediately mm. after the the three the, the three main trial. Mm. That, that, that came out and I'm sorry to say you know gosh you know what, what long-term damage have I done to their bones their cardiovascular risk their dementia risk now we know that that it is a lot safer but like you say for some women it's not it's not appropriate and and actually those I think when I first started out as a GP and I didn't get any menopause training as a GP at all none none whatsoever so it was purely self-interest that I went into it for but I often thought oh you know diet lifestyle I'm just talking about <laughs> stuff and people aren't really going to listen and and actually when you think about it and when women change things even slightly the difference is a mm -hmm. and so I would echo what you say about diet and lifestyle yes we bandy those words out but I can't emphasize enough just how important those changes are because if you do nothing else like you said at the very beginning we're planning the next 35 years <laughs> and the foundation of those is diet and lifestyle and and actually you know you can make some big big changes that will will protect your 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 general health going forward so sorry that was digressing I can't even No, it's good yep. about, but yeah <laughs> uh, breast cancer so yes I think yes I think we've just got to remember we're women we we we're 
we've got a risk of breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, that's not a modifiable risk, but the ones we can modify are the ones we've spoken about. We'll take another pause there and listen to <laughs> some messages from our sponsors. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Welcome back to UK Health Radio. You're listening to the Menopause Sisters and today we are talking to Laura Bryden and we were discussing risks around um, breast cancer and alcohol just before that ad break and actually just diet in general. You know, we know some of the vasomotor symptoms can be increased by alcohol by caffeine by spicy food there's just different different triggers for every woman and actually it's just beginning to work out perhaps keep a food diary or a note of of what are your what are your triggers and and leading on from that laura i'd love to talk to you about iodine because often we talk about you know supplements like vitamin d really important for our bone health and that's one we always recommend and magnesium can be helpful for so many symptoms but something we don't hear very much about is, is iodine yes so iodine is a, one of my favorite nutrients, supplements for women's health. I do want to say at the outset that you need to be careful with it, or everyone, anyone listening. It's, um, it's both powerful and also a little just tricky to use sometimes, but doesn't mean, I mean, so I would obviously I'll, I'll speak about it. And then I would encourage you to read my, the section in my book about it. And I have a blog post about some of the safety things. So we all think that we all, all of us know iodine for its role in thyroid hormone. It is, of course essential for thyroid health. At the same time, too much iodine can be a problem for thyroid. And this is where some of the, I guess, controversy or some of the trickiness comes in. So the other thing that iodine does though, is it's one of its powers or one of its roles in the body is also, you know, so iodine just broadly is important for immune function. It has lots of other roles. Um, one of the things it seems to do, according to the research, is downregulate estrogen receptors. So it tends to kind of calm estrogen sensitive tissue, particularly breasts. So there has been some research, not as much as I'd like to see, but around iodine, slightly higher dose iodine, I'll talk about the dose for treating fibrocystic breast type symptoms. So breast pain, breast cysts, and it I'll just say that it's one of these few natural supplements where it is like an absolute game changer. When it's the right supplement, it can pretty much, I mean, eliminate breast pain. And I know that's a strong statement to make, but that's my experience clinically. That's certainly what I'm seeing with some of the research. So to, to do that, I guess um, I'm talking about a level of potentially one to three milligrams. I'm going to mention a brand it, that's available in the US just because they have quite a bit of research on their website. There's a practitioner's section on their website. They talk about the mechanism of how iodine works for breasts. So they're called Violet Daily. I don't have any shares in the company or anything. This is not an affiliate thing. It's just, I'm just mentioning it because I do like them as a product. So that's, they're three milligrams. So that's 3000 micrograms, which is obviously higher than the RDA of iodine. I would just say that's only appropriate for people who don't have thyroid disease. So in particular, obviously a diagnosed thyroid disease, or I go a step further with my own patients and, well, I don't know how easy this will be in the UK, but I screen them for thyroid, something called thyroid antibodies. So I, I kind of, I screen them for an underlying Hashimoto's or autoimmune thyroid, which is not uncommon, especially if someone in your family has has thyroid disease, it's, it's likely to be autoimmune. So I don't like to give iodine to someone with something going on with their thyroid, because that's when you can potentially get into trouble. But for some for women who don't have their thyroids fine, they have no thyroid autoimmunity. My overwhelming experience is dosing that way with iodine for, you know, six to 12 months anyway is fine. You can obviously you could do a periodic, you know, thyroid check just to be sure everything's okay. And the relief from it is just so immense. I mean, not just for, I mean, I feel like I'm doing an infomercial for ID, but not just for breast pain, but potentially for some of the premenstrual mood symptoms for um, something called adenomyosis, kind of heavy periods to some extent, it can really move, move the needle on some of those symptoms. And I think it's, I would interpret it as in large part from sort of an anti-estrogen effect on some of that. So I hope that's not too technical. You know, I guess we, I said, we'll put the show in the show. If you have show notes, we'll put some links so people can read about that. In my book, I have some, you know, how to speak to your doctor about it 
would definitely involve saying, is my thyroid okay? Like I'm just, you know, checking if this is something safe for me to try. So, and also potentially there could be a, um, from iodine, a, potentially a risk reduction for breast cancer. And there's a little bit of research, actually, there's a little bit of research of using it, trialing iodine to help as part of an adjunct for breast cancer therapy. So it's definitely on the radar as something good for breasts. And um, in terms of the actual you know, breast cancer risk reduction, it's sort of a watch the space situation, but I'd love to see more research about that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds fascinating. And like like you say, you know, we would, we would bracket that with, you know, obviously talk about, talk about this with your healthcare provider. Just yes. You get all that, that correct information. Like you said, it's so important to do that family history, that personal history and to get all that information down so that you know, you're doing the right thing, but it's so fascinating. And we often talk in in menopause clinics about there being not very much evidence for things, you know, previously being bad evidence and now not being kind of really robust evidence either way. But I like hearing about kind of your own personal evidence and anecdotal mm-hmm. evidence. I talk about mm-hmm. that a lot with patients. Mm-hmm. You know, it's practice based evidence. It's not randomized controlled trials. It's not, you know, that there's been thousands of studies, but actually women have tried things and they've tried things for centuries and there's a reason why some of these things work and there might not be trials always to support that but as if it's safe and if it's done in a safe way it's it why not is is it not worth a try um and I think that's that's the important point I think to get across isn't it exactly so in terms of evidence I think the level of evidence required for a therapeutic does depend on its cost benefit ratio, right? Like if, if it is a fairly safe, inexpensive treatment to try, then I think it's safe, it's reasonable to try that without being a hundred percent convinced that it's going to work. In fact, in some of the how to speak with your doctor or how to speak with your pharmacist sections in the book, I do say like the question to the doctor is, is this safe for me to try? The doctor doesn't have, it's not like getting the doctor across the line is, are you sure this is going to work? Because that's a tough call for any, almost any treatment, but you know, it's, it's sort of weighing that up. And for a lot of the supplements, it's very safe for iodine. It's a little less safe, which is why we've talked, you know, a bit more detail about trying to make sure that you're a candidate for it and that it's a a safe thing to try. Yeah. And we talk about in the UK, we, we have obviously the nice guidance that we adhere to. And we talk about quite a lot in the menopause of unknown treatments, but we talk about shared decision making so involving um, your patient your client in the discussion giving them as much information as is available either way and allowing that person in front of you to make their own Mm. choice so that actually it's a less paternalistic look at medicine than it was sort of five or ten years ago and it's much more about let's do this together and yes I don't know but certainly I don't think a trial of this is going to cause you any harm or vice versa you know you can obviously say the, com- the complete opposite and go actually I think that's a really bad idea exactly <laughs> yeah explain like your reason but but yeah. it's having those options and having that open discussion with your practitioner because without that you form a barrier and then nothing gets done and no one's any happier I mean certainly as I as a GP wouldn't be happy if I kind of had that barrier in front of me and go no it's my way or the highway it has improved a lot because I can tell you even 10 years ago my patients were like not wanting to tell their doctors about the supplements they're taking. I'm like, that's not a good idea. Like, so you want the relationship to be such that at least, you know, the doctors are okay with hearing about it. You know, they may not endorse everything or really know about it all, but at least they have that information. Yeah. I think that's the key, isn't it? Is that yeah. we, we may not as Western medical doctors know about all the alternatives. And that is where we can learn from our patients. And that is really key, I think. You know, many years ago, I remember a patient coming in with breast pain and saying, I've just tried evening primrose oil. And I was like, why did you do that? You know, <laughs> what's that going to do? She said, well, I've taken it in this dose and actually my breast pain's gone. It's completely disappeared. Mm. And I was like, oh, OK, well, that's one woman. But then slowly, slowly, you know, things. <laughs> so I think it's just important to kind of recognise women know their own bodies and uh, and western medicine isn't always the answer we think about holistic care don't we Karen we think about talking about perimenopause and menopause holistically and not just thinking about HRT and alternative but thinking about yoga thinking about breathing techniques and we were just we were chatting about that earlier weren't we just this holistic approach you know we've talked about nutrition we've talked about hormone replacement replacement therapy we've and you've mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy Claire um and are there any other 
elements that you'd like to mention, Lara, that maybe helped you, supported you or your clients around the kind of lifestyle um, choices? Well, I do just want to point a little, shine some light on insulin resistance as a thing, (laughs) because this is, well, I explained in the book, you know, this potentially plays a big role in some of the symptoms. It certainly plays a big role in some of the longer term risks, especially around dementia and cardiovascular disease. So it's, it, it's just a bit of a catch 22 because insulin, I'll, I'll explain what it is in a minute, but the insulin resistance can make symptoms worse, can increase the risk, but also at the same time, the shift to menopause, which is a natural thing that's going to happen, does in, shift us to insulin resistance. It increases our risk of insulin resistance. That That's true for all of us which doesn't mean all of us will go all the way to insulin resistance, but it becomes easier to get there. So insulin resistance is pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome. I don't know what terms would be used in the UK, but it's um, the way I assess for it is a high, a high fasting insulin. I do a glucose tolerance test where I measure the hormone insulin as well. So it's this high insulin state and it's associated with weight gain around the middle and just some like high cholesterol and some negative cardiovascular thing. And it's very common as you know. So in women and not just women, but like people kind of over 45, it's like one in two individuals are in that area of pre, you know, pre-diabetes and it's reversible, which is the other good reason to talk about it because of course we always want to talk about things that we can do something about. So I would just say if on your checklist, you know, for everyone listening, if just think about whether that might apply to you, you can read that section in my book, you know, there's lots of resources about it and just try to identify if that's what's going on and know that it's reversible and that by reversing it, you're going, this is one of the best things you can do in this critical window of health that we talked about right at the beginning and potentially, you know, re, you know reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke and dementia and some of the negative outcomes that we're all trying to avoid. Actually, even insulin resistance even plays a role in um, bone health to some extent. We haven't really talked about osteoporosis, but yeah. So that would be one of my other tips. <laughs> I'm glad you covered that, Laura, because actually it was on my list of things to sort of touch on and ask yeah. you about. So it's great. Um, great. We've managed to get that in as we probably need to begin to, to wind up already. I know. Actually. <laughs> it goes by fast. It goes by quickly. Yeah. Always, always too quick. We love to ask our guests to leave us with two or three kind of top tips or, you know, things that you would ask perhaps your clients or suggest women think about or read or, you know, what, what advice would you like to leave our listeners with? Trust your body. I always, I always sort of end most interviews with this. This is one of my key messages in both my books. So not just for perimenopause, but for periods as well. Your body wants to be healthy. Your body is not your enemy. Your body is not broken. It does know what to do, which is not to say it doesn't sometimes need extra help or even medical intervention sometimes, but it, it has a wisdom. I, I really believe that it, it's, it's trying to be healthy. So that can, you know, just influence everything else. So then trust your body, you know, start with, don't underestimate the benefits of moving your body. I, I always say movement rather than exercise these days. Cause I just sort of like the, the joyfulness of that and magnesium and quitting alcohol. Those are four things, but <laughs> those are like, those can be those you do that. And actually what I say to my patients, like if well, I get them on a magnesium plus taurine formula, taurine is an amino acid. You can read about it in my book. I say, if you move your body, get outside in the morning, move your body, take taurine, quit alcohol. I said 50, I said 50% chance. That's all you're going to need in terms of hot flushes and night sweats. And that's, I'd say 50, 50 is about how it is maybe 50 percent of need to go on and do something more like hormone therapy fantastic yeah <laughs> thank you so much laura thank you so much for yeah. taking the time to speak to us it's been fantastic just to be able to connect and as, as i said earlier just a huge fan of your book and, and would recommend it again and again it's the hormone repair manual by laura bryden you can read a bit more about laura on her website which is www.larabryden.com and you're also on social media aren't you laura and i know you share a lot yeah. on there yeah just at laura bryden i'm easy to find i've actually just started a forum as well which is for everyone i am you know moderating it just make sure nothing crazy goes in there but like in general i encourage practitioners so if anybody if you too or if anybody listening wants to kind of ch- chime in and share their experience yeah okay. my new projects it's a pleasure to um speak to you and i'm i'm very grateful to you to, for joining us today